Hearing a scripture about hope causes me to think about all of the ways in which our hope is challenged. Mass shootings in schools and grocery stores, in churches and theaters, in nightclubs and at parties on the streets. Since Uvalde, Texas and the massacre there in which 22 were killed and 17 injured, Back on May the 24th, there have been 28 more mass shootings in the United States, resulting in 40 deaths and 149 injuries. Three of those shootings happened yesterday. Yesterday, authorities arrested 31 members of a white supremacist group called the Patriot Front. They were caught packed into the back of a U-Haul truck, dressed in uniform-like khakis, navy blue shirts, and beige hats, with white balaclavas covering their faces, and armbands on their shirts and logos on their hats identifying them as the Patriot Front. They were found with smoke bombs and riot gear, shin guards and shields and bats, and were just about to launch an attack on several gay pride events taking place yesterday, and that's in Idaho. And this past week in Watauga, Texas, the pastor of Steadfast Baptist Church, Dylan Oz, said in his sermon that gay people should be executed terrorist style by being shot in the back of the head just for being gay. Yes, our hope, our hope for peace, our hope for civility, our hope for justice, our hope for righteousness, our hope for sanity in this broken land is severely challenged. And this just scratches the surface of the violence that is present in our lives today, of the violence that, are, that is present in our communities today, the violence against people, innocent people who've done nothing, violence and hatred, bigotry and discrimination. I mean, we, we, we talk about it and, and sometimes we just go, oh, hum, that started with Cain and Abel and it's been going ever since. And that's true, but... It is now a characteristic of our society that hundreds and hundreds of drive-by shootings, mass shootings, massacres happen, and we just go, oh, 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 shame. It's become part of our society that it takes massive numbers and children being killed for us to be shocked enough by it to even pay attention to it for more than just a few minutes. A huge challenge to our hope, though, is manifested by this kind of violence, this kind of hatred, this kind of inhumanity to our fellow humans through actions, deeds, threats, and words. It's real, my friends, and it is a challenge to our hope. What is hope in the face of violence and persecution and oppression. What is hope? Where as Christians can we find our hope? In the church? Well, it's challenged there too. In the Florida Annual Conference this past week, the clergy session, which is a gathering of about 300 plus elders and deacons, in the Florida Annual Conference, voted to not approve an entire class of 16 candidates for commissioning on track to ordination as elder or as deacon. And they were voted down because two of them, and just two of them, happened to be LGBTQ. Just identified as such. And 86 
elders and deacons in the Florida conference voted no to approve the entire class, including some of those 16 who were conservatives and traditionalists. So was their hatred, so was their anger that two of them might be gay, that they voted down the entire class of candidates. The cry throughout the denomination has, has been loud from centrists and moderates as well as from progressives at the injustice to the total class inherent in this kind of bitter, bitterness and bigotry and hatred. So what is hope? Where is hope? How can hope be found? How is hope manifested in our lives? That's what the scripture's about today from Paul's letter to the Romans. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I preached a message in which I challenged Paul's understanding of the cause of homosexuality. I presented an analysis of what he had to say in 1 Corinthians and pointed out the horrible failure of most translations to deal effectively with the passage here, the, the, the ambiguity of two of the words which just don't really make any sense. And I also pointed out that Paul's thinking on same gender sexual attraction as being God's punishment for idolatry is simply not applicable to homosexuals today given our modern understanding of psychology and biology. And since then, since I preached that message and published it online, more than just a few people have contacted me, all from out there, most through the internet, but a couple over phone calls and messages left on answering systems and my own cell phone, accusing me of hating the Bible, of hating Paul, of not taking the scriptures seriously. Go figure. Wow. It's the reaction I expected. It's most ironic because I love the scriptures. I respect Paul. Even when I disagree with him, I respect him. I understand where he's coming from. I understand why he wrote some of the things he wrote and did some of the things he did. And when I disagree with him, I disagree with him. And I have reasons for it. But today we have a beautiful reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. One of my tip, top, top, excuse me, one of my ten top favorite. That's that, that'll twist your tongue up. One of my ten top favorite passages of Scripture. And it comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified by faith, not works, not keeping the law, not being straight or not being gay, not uh, believing in certain, behaving in certain specific ways or, or believing in long complicated doctrines about things like the Holy Trinity. We're justified by faith, considered righteous, by faith in Jesus. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ because we have said yes to the offered gift of grace that we receive from God that comes before we do anything. And we have said yes to that relationship with God in Jesus Christ. And we have said yes, I want to follow you, I want to be your disciple. We've said yes to the offered love of God. And because we have said yes and we've acted in faith, we are justified, considered just as righteous as Jesus. I was told by a pastor that I couldn't and wouldn't have peace with God. I couldn't have salvation. I would not enter the kingdom of God until I got delivered from the demons of homosexuality. Until I got married to a woman, I would be going to hell. 
I thought it was about faith. I thought salvation was about faith. Not works, not doing certain things and not doing other things. I thought it was about faith, about accepting God's grace and living by faith in Jesus. That's what this scripture says. And it keeps going. There, through whom? Let me back it up. Therefore, since we, have been, we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom? We have obtained access to this grace in which we stand and we boast in our hope. We boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Because of faith, because of God's grace, because of the love that God has for us in Jesus and because our calling to love God and to love neighbor as ourselves, because of faith, because of grace, we have hope of sharing the glory of God. You know, that's pretty big, friends. The glory of God is nothing small. The glory of God is everything. And if we have hope of sharing in the glory of God because of faith and because of grace, then we have nothing else to be concerned about. We have nothing else to fear, no matter what somebody else might say to us. And not only that, Paul writes, you know, he doesn't ever stop, he keeps going. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings. You know, uh, this part I'm not sure I'm going to like. We also, well, maybe, we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us. I love this sequence. I love it because it speaks to today, to where we are right here and right now in the midst of a whole lot of suffering and a whole lot of need to endure and a whole lot of character. And my friends, by the way, we're a whole bunch of characters here. We've been formed, we've been shaped, we've been molded by God's grace and by the experiences that we've had in our walk of faith. And it has molded us into the people that we are today. And God's grace infuses all of that with God's love. When we suffer, we grow in endurance. And that endurance, when we grow and learn from it, generates within us character. And we have come, and we have some really, really good reasons to celebrate the grace we have received, the endurance that we've experienced and grown in, and the characters that we have become. People who are steadfast, Resolute, loving, caring, enduring, appreciating, including, and welcoming. And all of this character, all of this grace, all of this love, all of this faith, even amidst the suffering, through endurance, produces in us hope. The Greek word rendered hope here is elpis, and elpis has at its heart the same root word found in Greek for the word for faith, pistis. Faith is pistis, hope is elpis. You hear that commonality, that peace sound in there, elpis, pistis? It's the, it's the root word, the same root word in the midst of these other words. Hope and faith are two sides of the same coin. You can't have one without the other. With faith there is hope, and with hope there is faith. And we have lots of reasons, my friends, to have faith and to have hope. Reasons that are built within the life and the ministry and the death and resurrection and the ascension and the continued real presence by the power of the Holy Spirit of Jesus the Christ. Hope that is rooted in His healings and His teachings, His preachings, His feedings and His forgiving. Hope that is rooted in His life and His ministry, His death and His resurrection. 
hope and faith that live amidst the message of Christ. Hope and faith that we experience in our lives as a family of God here in this church, which is filled with love, filled with faith, and filled with hope. We just had an annual conference session here beginning a week ago, and the business sessions were on Monday and Tuesday of the North Texas Conference of the United Methodist Church. That is the conference of which this church is a part. A lot of things happened at this conference. Some of them were, I've got to admit, somewhat disappointing, but some have given me a small measure of hope. One thing that gives me hope is that the North Texas Conference passed a resolution, passed by 95 plus percent, I think it was closer to 98 percent, a resolution supporting trans children and their families. I was one of the co-signers of this resolution. I helped the Reverend Jeffrey Moore over at St. Stephen in wordsmithing some of it, putting it together. In that, re- in that resolution, we state as a conference, our churches in the North Texas Conference will be safe sanctuaries for trans children, youth, and their families, and further, while we acknowledge the obligation of our clergy ha- have as mandatory, re- mandatory reporters, we do not, because of our convictions of faith, consider gender-affirming care, child abuse, and thus will not report it as such. Thank you. Yes. This is a statement from the North Texas Conference by almost the entirety of the conference that we do not consider gender-affirming care for trans people to be abuse, contrary to what our state government is saying. And we will make our homes, our church homes, safe sanctuaries for them. And we will not be reporting them to the government, despite what a governor's regulation says. Another positive thing to come out of the North Texas Conference this week was a statement from the Board of Ordained Ministry. Now, the Board of Ordained Ministry's responsibility is to interview candidates for ministry, to investigate their backgrounds, investigate their studies, ask them questions, give them exams, consider them carefully, and then upon investigation and examination, approve them for commissioning and ordination as elders and deacons in ministry and pastor of churches in the North Texas Conference. It's a big job. It's a big job. And they set policies and standards by which they go about their process. It's not just willy-nilly. There's some really clear, well thought out and planned uh, uh, guidelines by which we interview people and approve people for ministry. Part of that is in a policy that was established relative to LGBTQ plus persons. I want to read this to you. It's a little long, so bear with me. LGBTQ plus persons have been active in our children's and youth programs, attended our camps, participated in mission trips, served as faithful leaders in our congregations, and are responding to a call from God to ordained ministry. While currently the Book of Discipline affirms their response to God's call, it simultaneously prohibits them from the blessings of marriage that we celebrate for heterosexual candidates. As a diverse conference serving a diverse mission field, this restriction not only hampers our witness, but also functions as a double standard for LGBTQ plus persons called to ordained ministry. To honor the rich theological diversity of our conference, we believe 
that two principles must be addressed. First, self-avowed practicing homosexuals should not be excluded from certification, ordination, or appointment, provided they are otherwise qualified by the rigorous standards required by the Book of Discipline and the North Texas Conference in the areas of theology and doctrine, worship and proclamation and call, service and disciplined life. Second, in the context of this process of consultation, congregations should not be expected to compromise their theological convictions when receiving appointed pastors. Our theological diversity is a strength of our Methodist heritage. Allowing for these theological differences in practice will strengthen our witness in a society badly in need of the good news of Jesus Christ. Further, providing the theological space for faithful Christians to agree to disagree regarding LGBTQ plus inclusion is a powerful countercultural witness in these diverse times. Now that policy is very important. I'll read point one again. Self-avowed practicing homosexuals should not be excluded from certification, ordination, or appointment. Wow. That's huge, my friends. When I was ordained a deacon in 1991 and an elder in 1994, a statement like this would have never been approved by the North Texas Conference. And yet, last year, this policy was proposed, and this year, it was approved without a single objection from the floor. That, my friends, is amazing. Well, while not binding, it still calls us to full inclusion. While hedged with language which provides cover for those who disagree with full inclusion for LGBTQ persons, it still states that all will be included in the life of the church and, yes, at all levels. And that is a policy now of the North Texas Conference, and it is manifested in my appointment as your pastor. That gives me hope. Hope for our ministries here together, hope for our outreach to people who need to hear the good news of the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Hope that we will continue in active mission and ministry in this community to all the people around us without restriction and without limitation. Hope that we will be about sharing God's love. And personally, hope that after October the 1st, I'll still be your pastor after Kate and I are married. My brothers and sisters, we have hope. We have hope, most importantly and primarily in Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, the source of grace and our true hope. And in his life, in his ministry, his death and his resurrection, we have hope for eternal life and life here today. Hope that calls us to proclaim the love of God to all. Hope that enables us to give the love of God to all. Hope that enables us to be the true disciples of Jesus that God has called us to be, sharing the gospel of God's love with all. Yes, we have hope. Yes, there are many challenges to our hope, but we have hope in Jesus. Hope in His grace, hope in God's love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, Let me and of the Holy Spirit.
よ」